Oh, God. <laughs> Tyler Perry must be stopped. There, there, we got to take the pen away. He, we, I don't know what we can do as a collective, as a community, but we got to get on it. <laughs> so I have just had the frustrating displeasure of watching Tyler Perry's newest movie, a Netflix original by the name of Mia Culpa, starring Kelly Rowland. And I will never get that time back. And I'm a little salty about it. <laughs> if you're new to the channel, Tyler Perry is actually no stranger to the channel at all. Uh, we've done videos on his fall from grace, acrimony, and now we're gonna talk about this. Yay. Mia Culpa, again, is a Netflix original film written and directed by Tyler Perry about a defense attorney named Mia. Oh, see what you did there. Who takes on a case of a famous painter who has been accused of murdering his girlfriend. It's another one of these films that are falling into this pattern that I'm noticing that Tyler Perry has been going down for the last few years. Basically, very convoluted, soapy, erotic, crime thrillers that are just terrible works of storytelling, no understanding of continuity, law, <laughs> just anything. And this is coming from a bitch that don't know shit about the law other than watching a lot of Legal Eagle. Hey, Legal Eagle, Devin. I like smart guys. Teach me something, eagle daddy. Anyway, mea culpa, as in the legal term, is supposed to be translated to through my fault, my mistake. Haha, -ha. we got, you know, look at us. We got something deep there. We got the title. It means my fault. So you know that our main character is gonna make maybe not the best decisions. It's pretty obvious from any minute you spend watching the movie that she's gonna f the painter, um, which is definitely not a great thing to do. And yeah, it's just an example of a decidedly worsening level of quality as far as like storytelling from Tyler Perry. I'm getting the sense that this one wasn't even written by people. I think this is like some weird convoluted bag of Wattpad tropes written by AI and sewn together by Tyler Perry. That's my theory, but who, who am I? So today we're gonna talk about that. You're welcome. <laughs> It's what I do. I sacrifice myself for the people every week. What can I say? But before we get started, hello, it's Kendall here. If you're new around here, welcome. Not new around here, what is up? Home skillet biscuit. What little random tidbit do I want to tell you guys this week? I'm drinking protein coffee on my healthy girl tings. Also excuse that my apartment is getting messier behind me each week. I also love how we've just accepted that this is my new setup. <laughs> Like I, one time I didn't clean my office, still haven't cleaned it fully. And now this is where we film. All right. Some of you guys seem to have to like it though. It feels homey. Okay. So before we get started, the only thing left is to pay some bills. Cause I just got a new bill that is very expensive. That's going to be every month. I love American healthcare system. Cause y'all don't cover shit. No, you don't cover shit. Yeah, watch this ad, please, as I cry myself to sleep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. This is Avril Kenny, and today's video is sponsored by Fume, the innovative, battery-free way to kick your bad habit. Instead of harmful chemicals, you fill the fume with flavored cores and breathe in all natural, delicious flavored air. It comes with a dial that you can adjust airflow and it also is weighted. So if you are a fidgeter with your fingers, this is also a great way to keep your hands busy while you're breaking your habit. It comes in a bunch of different cool flavors. I have favorites. Currently I'm on orange vanilla and I'm a big fan. It also has a stronger taste than I thought it would. Mmm. Mmm. Also back in January, they launched base, which is a magnetized weighted base that you can use to put your fume on when you're not using it. Not to mention, it just looks really cool. So if you would like to try Fume, you can head over to my link down in the description box, which is tryfume.com slash KennyJD, or you can use the QR code somewhere on this here screen and use code KennyJD to get 10% off when you get the journey pack today. That's tryfum.com slash KennyJD to save an additional 10% off today. Big thanks again to Fume for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get on to the debauchery. 
As I kind of mentioned before, this movie is absolute garbage. <laughs> Not to spoil the video. It's a confusing and disjointed grab bag of mess. Uh, forced chemistry. It does fall in line in that like genre of like terrible man that we're supposed to find sexy even though he's really creepy. Tale is all this time. I'm not gonna blame Tyler Perry for that one. It's very like not quite as campy as like a 365 though I would say that the main guy is you know, maybe just under as alarming as that dude is. Speaking of which, when is the next 365 movie coming out? I'm, you know, I, I made fun of them, but we didn't finish. I want to know, I want to know how it ends. Like, come on. So this exists within those like serious Tyler Perry movies, which are becoming the majority now that I think about it. Like he's leaning more into like the soap drama area more so than like the comedies that I grew up with, with him. We're going into this like, Zane sex chronicles type thing. An interesting exploration into black women and sexuality. I think like a fall from grace, temptation, like that type of thing, but not flushed out at all. No nuance, no real character development, no real human dialogue. <laughs> it's just a mess. So I'm gonna take you down the ride of this boo boo dookie movie and we're gonna talk about what happens in Mia Culpa. 2024. So our main character, as you may have guessed, is named Mia. And she opens the movie in couples therapy with her husband, Cal. They are there because they've hit a rough patch in their marriage. She expects him of cheating on her with his childhood friend, Jenna, which he denies. He says he was simply holding her hand. And she's like, bullshit, you cheated on me with her. And whenever she brings more things to consider in regards to that, he claims that she lawyers him, letting us know she's a lawyer. She's like, he only pulls out the lawyer card when he knows I'm asking him the tough questions. Very early, you can tell from the tone and the, the, the like ping-ponging of conversation that this movie is gonna give me whiplash and I was not wrong. <laughs> like there's so much expository dialogue. It's hard to keep up, okay? If I mess up some small details, you can blame me if you want, but I blame Tyler Perry. Anyway, before they can really reach any conclusion uh, during this session, he leaves early saying that his mother is calling him and Mia insinuates that the mother is a big issue in their relationship anyway. She uh, shoehorns herself into the relationship. She is more a part of this marriage than anything else. She obviously wants them not to be together. She obviously would prefer him be with someone else, namely that childhood friend, Jenna. And though Mia talks about how frustrating it is to have her as this wedge, Cal doesn't want to set any boundaries with his mother because she has cancer and she kind of used that as leverage to do whatever she wants and be deeply inappropriate about their marriage. So rude, but that's what she does. Speaking of which, we end up meeting the mom after this because Mia decides to stay for the session even though Cal leaves early. And so Mia comes late to the birthday dinner that they're having for the mom. And she's like, oh, the queen has arrived. The mom says, like, oh, it's good for you to make it. And I think this is where we should touch on the mom being cartoonishly evil. You know this by her red wig, the soap opera disposition, her constant snide remarks, feel like she's going to do like an evil cackle at the end of it. <laughs> Anime laugh. <laughs> She's very disrespectful overtly, you know, kind of pushes her at the end of the table to sit next to her friend and sister-in-law, Charlize, so that Cal and Jenna can sit closer together. She's very cartoonishly evil, which makes it so that I knew the moment I saw her, that bitch does not have cancer. <laughs> like I knew that we gonna find out before this movie is over, that bitch does not have cancer. With that said, Cal does nothing to defend his wife against Miss Invisible Part. And it's really gross. He's just like, oh, ha, my mom, here's a gift for your birthday. And it's a very expensive watch. And so he just kind of dotes on his mom and she dotes on him and she's rude as f to his wife while like trying to mush him and Jenna together. Also at the table, notably, is that fun mother from the Christmas movies with Vanessa Hudgens and Vanessa Hudgens and Vanessa Hudgens. Princess Witch, ooh. And I could tell by the lighting, he's gonna be a bad guy. <laughs> he plays Cal's brother, Ray, and Ray is also a lawyer. Uh, and he talks about how he is going to be the prosecutor for a famous case or a high profile case that is taking place right now for a famous local painter named Zaire Malloy. And Ray kind of talks in passing about how he has some of his paintings in his home and he was thinking about how to get rid of them 
them now that he's, you know, a social pariah. But yeah, we can kind of tell already that he's going to be a bit of a pretentious dick throughout the movie. And as much as I love him, it works. It looks good on him. <laughs> Again, Ray's wife is Mia's only friend at the table, and her name is Charlize. Girl got good skin. Good skin, good makeup, gorgeous base. That's good. Her hair looks, she's really pretty. That's nice. I don't have really anything else to say to her about her in this moment. Just like, ooh, makeup. Ah! Glow. So they have the dinner on the drive home. Mia questions Cal about that expensive ass watch that he just bought his mom because they don't have the money for that. So he says, well, I paid for it by selling the piano that he gave Mia a few years ago. So it was her piano <laughs> and he sold it to give his bitchy ass mom a watch for her birthday. She's upset and he's like, well, I'm just trying to make her last days happy. You know, she just wanted it. Like, I, and also you're all frustrated because you think I want something with Jenna. I don't want anything with Jenna. But this would definitely fall in line with a mother that has no sense of boundaries. So gross. So the next day Mia goes to work and she is met with Zaire Malloy, the painter who is on trial for murder because he's coming to her to ask her to be his defense. And he is like, I did not kill my girlfriend. And the DA, Ray, is a dickhead. So he's gonna be trying to lock me up. I need the best and I heard you're the best. She's like, uh, that might be a conflict of interest because he's my brother-in-law. And Zaire's like, I don't give a f I heard you're the best, so I'm hiring you. Also within this first meeting is where we get one of many moments in which this movie shoehorns sexual attention between two people that either can't act or are doing the best they can with a Tyler Perry script. And though the acting isn't great, I am more inclined to say the latter. <laughs> but they shoe on the sexual tension. It's very awkward and uncomfortable, but sure, whatever, fine. So after a workout class, Mia and Charlize notice a bunch of people protesting outside of a local gallery because they have Zaire's paintings and the art gallery woman has no desire to get rid of them. <sighs> this is such a fantasy world. What painter? <laughs> Is that important that any of this would be some big like social thing, but okay, let alone that they're gonna be protesting outside of a random gallery to get rid of his paintings, but okay. And this is where Mia tells Charlize, or admits to her, I think is a better word, that she's considering representing him. Charlize is like, oh my God, please don't take it. Obviously, because he's a social pariah, but more so probably because her husband is his, his the prosecutor, he's the DA. But Charlize isn't the only person that's saying, hey, don't do this shit, this is a bad look. So too is her husband. He tries to pull, I'm a man, and I say what, what I say goes because I'm a dude and I have a penis. She's like, that's hilarious because you don't have any money. Are you gonna pay the bills? Are you gonna take care of things? Because if you recall, Ex, a lot of expository dialogue. You got high and drunk while working as an anesthesiologist. And so because of that, they fired you. And I just have to say getting crossfaded while putting people to sleep is insane. That's wild. Who's gonna pay the bills? The car note, your mother's medical bills for that matter, because obviously you can't. So you're not gonna tell me what case I can and can't take. You're the reason we're in a bad financial situation. Not to mention his family doesn't even know that he lost his job because he's the perfect sign. This is me talking. He should just be happy that he's not in jail because he definitely could have killed somebody. So shut the up and let me do my job. So later she decides to meet with Zaire at his law to discuss in further detail whether or not she would take on the case. And being that he is so high profile, they have to meet at his place so that, you know, the paparazzi will follow him everywhere. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it's a movie. So when she gets there, he's playing sad, sexy 70s music. You know, he's painting tortured artists. He asks what she sees in the painting. She says longing. He decides to then call the painting Mia is longing and it's not hard to pick up for any person watching including mia to see that zaire has a very flirtatious nature and she rightfully curves it completely and says i'm here for business all right i'm here i'm here because you're on trial for murder <laughs> weirdo and i gotta say there that really proves that something's wrong even if he didn't kill her something's wrong with you like in a weird way something's very wrong because your first thought hey i'm meeting my new lawyer for my to defend me in my murder case damn i really want to 
fuck her. Go get some help. Jesus. She wants him to replay all the events, how he met the lady that died, what their relationship was like, any details that you think are too much, they're not too much, they're just what I need. He says that he met her on a trip to Italy. She was a waitress at a restaurant he was at. And over the course of 10 days, they fell into a feverish love affair and they were inseparable for six months after that. He talks about her in that very like wistful artsy way and Mia kind of brings it back to earth saying like there's evidence that there was so much blood in your apartment that was hers that it sleeped down into your neighbor's apartment down below you. I just remembered something that don't make sense again. Okay, hold on. Let me take a note. Not me retelling the story and realizing more things that don't make sense. <laughs> Anyway, but yeah, she's like, we found DNA that matches the girl, her blood, so much of it was seeping down to the bottom floor and her skull fragments were lodged into a painting that was nearby. So obviously, what, what you gotta say about that? He says, I don't know, I, uh. Said painting that had skull fragments in it was titled Evil Bitch, which he claims is just a bad look because he asked her, just like he asked Mia, to look at a painting and name it what you think would be the best thing to name it. And she jokingly said Evil Bitch and I never changed it. Then Mia brings up the $3 million life insurance policy that was brought up for the woman. And he's like, I don't know nothing about that. So for some reason, she's still considering defending him, but she's like, I'm gonna need to know the good, the bad and the ugly. So she gets back home and her uh, husband's family is over there. Mother-in-law is cooking for the family for some reason, which is something that he's never done. And while they're there, Ray talks about how he's planning to run for mayor. They were very subtle there. <laughs> Biracial black man who looks like Obama running for office in Chicago. Subtle. But anyway, he's like, I'm running for mayor. And he also asks Mia, what's new with her? And he is obviously aware that she's considering representing Zaire, the man again, that he is head prosecutor against. Obviously Ray isn't okay with it. It's a bad look if he runs for office to see that the person he was going against was his sister-in-law, which <sighs> I don't know anything about the law. I just watch a lot of legal ego. But isn't that already a conflict? <laughs> like people that you're related to by marriage working on the same case, that just seems something like, you can't do that, right? I don't know, sounds stupid. Couldn't they like conspire together to like make him go to jail or make him get off? You know what I mean? I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, uh, but he's not cool with it because it's a bad look if he's trying to run for mayor and his sister-in-law is going against him in court. So he says that he's gonna use that case to really catapult himself as far as his political career so that everyone knows that he's quote, tough on crime. The mom, as usual, has a lot to say as well. And she kind of makes this definitive thing like you're not taking it. You need to consider the family. You're a part of this family now. You're not taking it. And so she just like me for real, I would take it immediately because you're not gonna tell me what to do, you old bitch. I was gonna say, I'll take you out before cancer will, but that's kind of up. <laughs> so she decides to get the help of a friend of hers who is a private investigator. And this private investigator, she also had look into her husband when she thought he was cheating on her only to find out that he was doing drugs. I guess he wasn't cheating on you at the time. Small victories. And she's going to get his help to look more into Zaire. She then goes to the judge with Ray to find out if it is okay for them to both lawyer the same case. And the judge is like, hey, you can do it. If you do anything bad, you're going straight to the bar, but yeah, fuck it. <laughs> this is my biggest logistic gripe. You can't do that, right? And, and I love how the movie just said, yeah, we're gonna acknowledge that it's a little weird, but we're also gonna do nothing about it. Anyway, so Mia and the PI go to Zaire to question him more about the women that he's dated in the past to show a bit of a pattern. And in this, is where we get the most uncomfortable and weird inclusion of sexual tension, sex in the story, where both Mia and P.I. read off notes that had been taken from girls who have had sex with Zaire. He liked to pull my hair and make me gag, spit on me. He got pleasure when I was in pain. What you booing him for? <laughs> Sound like a good time to me. Deep was never deep enough for him. If I didn't show pleasure on my face, he would do things to make me show pain. I'm waiting for the thing that makes me go, <gasps> but it's just like, so, so like yo, sounds like a good time to me. Zaire claims that the woman who made these comments was into that stuff. She was into rough stuff. She was insatiable. But the woman that passed away wasn't like that at all. And that was why he loved her. Okay. You can love somebody that likes rough sex. That Madonna 
war complex will get y'all every f***ing time, man. Anyway, so later when the PI is on his way out, Mia asks what he thinks about Zaire. And he answers in the stupidest sequence of words that I have ever heard. You read body language better than experts. Give me an opinion. I mean, he wasn't blinking a lot. His inflections were up in all the right places. Voice was pitched right. If he's not lying, he is a psychopath. I and mean, he believes his lies so much that he could, he could fool even me. What? <laughs> To this moment, to this exact moment, I have no idea what he meant or said in that moment. He's a psychopath and a liar, but he's so good at it that he's trustworthy and I believe him, but that definitely lying. And then she's like, I feel the exact same way. <laughs> It's like, so wait a second. If you have no evidence that he's lying in this like body language, you know, pseudoscience that you're using, why do you assume he's lying? <laughs> so whatever. So Mia comes back into the loft and finds Zaire smoking the bud, devil's lettuce out on the balcony. And apparently she's like, don't do that. Cause they could have a drug test at any time. Is, uh, is, is marijuana not okay in Illinois? What are the rules on marijuana in Illinois? I'm in Michigan, so it's very legal here. I went to school in Ann Arbor, baby. That's that hash bash she's like you need to lie low don't go outside unless it's very important like you about to die now again this movie is insistent on giving me whiplash so all of a sudden we get on the conversation of whether or not he's a womanizer which he denies he is not a womanizer he just likes sex but he's never done anything to hurt somebody never done anything to cause pain and this is funny in the moment but it becomes even funnier later because that is all he does. All he does is overstep boundaries and womanizes Mia. And he has a history of womanizing a bunch of other people. So regardless of how it causes detriment to him or anybody else around him, what are you talking about? But cool. So our PI friend goes out to Mexico to find information about the deceased. Her name was Heidi. Um, and originally she was from Mexico. So he's going around doing his private investigating uh, thing only to find that there's no information about some girl named Heidi. Meanwhile, Mia's trying to make headway in the case and here comes her husband being annoying and wanting love and shit, which he like, I wanna make it up to you. I wanna show you that I care. I wanna, blah, 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 blah. I wanna get things back to normal. And she's like, I, I gotta go to work. I mean, later, Mia is asking more about Zaire past conquests of sorts. Uh, and he says that any number of the women that I've been with in the past could be upset because I didn't fall in love with them. And they're, you know, probably bitter because of that. Um, the woman, for instance, that he had demonic sex with, just gross, ravenous, terrible things that they did. Apparently is gonna be a witness for the DA. So Mia is like, I need to know as much as I can about her. She is the owner of that art gallery that people are approaching protesting outside of and apparently they met he was trying to get his work into a gallery and before she even saw his paintings she accepted him immediately because she didn't give a f about his paintings she just wanted to f on his painting i don't know <laughs> on his paintbrush <laughs> i'm trying to make it i'm trying to make a pun she wanted to f okay and he <laughs> but at the time he was young and broke and desperate so he went along with it until he got some headway in his career and left her went bye bye um and because of that she was very upset furious uh she felt dejected as an older woman uh and she, and according to zaire she wanted to control him this bleeds into him trying to let or trying to make mia open up and he's like feeling controlled i bet that's something you're used to and she's like no i am i am not your friend i am your attorney but of course she gives the story anyway of how she married her husband quite young things were hard that's all the end he needs i'm sure then he brings her over to the canvas and tells her to close her eyes asks what is the first color that comes to mind when you think of your marriage she answers blue he gives her a paintbrush with blue paint on it and tells her to draw with her eyes closed they draw waves and he's a little too close for comfort. And feeling that things are getting a bit too close, she abruptly leaves and says that she's gonna miss her train. He offers to drive her instead. Guess he can leave the house now, even though she just literally just said, don't leave the house. But he offers to drive her on a motorcycle, which she declines, but she goes home thinking of the painting. She then has lackluster sex with her husband. Back at the office, Cal comes and brings her flowers, again, trying to mend things with their relationship. He asks her to go to dinner with him after they have couples therapy. She agrees. Um, but right then and right there, in comes Zaire with a hand on the small of her back 
inappropriate, and introduces himself to Cal. Obviously, Cal gets a sense another dog is in his park and is trying to piss on his wife. Sorry, proverbially, please. He gives her a kiss on the forehead while never leaving eye contact with Zaire and leaves. Now, being that Zaire wasn't supposed to leave his apartment, it is very interesting that he is now in her office, which he brings up. He says he was followed by the paparazzi and he doesn't understand why they're meeting in her office now. And she says this would be better. Obviously, she's saying that because she feels like if they meet in his apartment, you know, the sexual tension is starting to be palpable, blah, blah, blah. blah. But he's like, nah. I don't feel easy here. I don't feel at home here. I don't feel comfortable here. Let's do this back in my loft. So he goes, she comes to the loft again, and obviously he's trying to f And in order to make him stop, she reads off the various lists of, <laughs> not funny, but it was funny to read, monikers that they have for him being a suspected murderer as well as a sex machine. Because <laughs> that's equally important. Mr. Malloy, the sex murderer. Zaire Malloy killed his girlfriend so his paintings would go up in value. Zaire Malloy, he makes women fall for him and then kills them. But it's really funny because there's also an, an insinuation in there that he's killed multiple people, that there's a pattern of people that he's engaged with ending up dead. So it, considering there's only one, as far as we know, that's very funny. But yes, it's one of many things that don't make sense about this movie, especially as we go along. Speaking of not making sense, he is like, <laughs> Okay, if you can't admit that you have feelings for me, you're fired. I don't want to be like I think I need a new lawyer. Everything in your body says you're attracted to me, but you won't admit it to yourself or to me. I can't trust you. I don't want a lawyer who can't admit that they want to f me. You're dishonest. <laughs> <laughs> you are on trial for murder, up for the death penalty. And he's like, if you don't let me smash, I'd rather die. <laughs> so dramatic. Wow, my lawyer wants to keep her license as a lawyer instead of fucking me. Wow. She wants to make sure I don't get a lethal injection instead of sucking this. She wants to make sure I don't get a lethal injection when she could get a lethal injection of this. <laughs> God, Ugh. this is when he's like, I want to get some air. And he drags her along with him. She's like, you're not supposed to be out and about. And he was like, this isn't out and about. And when they get there, it's a sex club. Okay. And then go back to his loft. And he's like, you're ready now? <laughs> you sure you don't want to do it now? You just saw people having a whole lot of fun. <laughs> She's like, I'm not some like weak woman that you can seduce. I'm here trying to have boundaries with you and you're not respecting those. He's like, what do you need to have boundaries for? And then, <laughs> and then, <laughs> and he comes up to her and kisses her on the neck. And again, I assume that this is supposed to be sexy. I assume, but this shit is so cringe and so frustrating and so maddening. Like, dude, dude, even if he wasn't a murderer, I wouldn't be surprised if you would have a bunch of evidence that he's a racist. <laughs> like, because I've explicitly said to you, hey, this is my boundary. And you said, oh, this one? Electric slides over. <laughs> what are you doing? No one's ever not wanted to smash me, so you obviously don't mean it. <laughs> Remember when I said I wasn't a womanizer? So she turns him down again. And when she does that, from a black hole somewhere comes a white woman with her titties out. I have no idea. I have no idea where she came from. She says she's his neighbor, but when did she know? What was her cue to come up to the house? And she's like, yeah, I'm his neighbor. My name is Carrie. I don't know. Maybe she was hiding in the pantry next to Cheerios or some shit. Uh, there's something about this moment in particular. Well, all of the movie really, but this moment in particular that makes this movie feel less like a movie and more of Tyler Perry awkwardly clobbering through, wading through some exploration of sex and sexuality. Like this feels oddly childish. Like someone who has never seen people have chemistry, have conversation that leads or lends to some form of sexual attention. It's just, it's giving like porno parody, you know, star horror return of the stiffy <laughs> just dumb again this feels very 365 days just shit be happening like this is how i felt when they were um when they were playing putt putt golf and the ball went in her coochie that's why i was like huh so the white lady starts sucking and Mia is like, oh, I'm leaving. So she leaves. But the thing about his elevator is that it won't go down unless he pushes the button, which is also not scary at all. That's not something a murderer would do, trap you in his apartment. She's in the elevator. 
and he pushes the button down after she's sufficiently seen him getting hit. Okay, just misunderstood, I guess. He's not a weirdo at all, just just misunderstood. But anyway, on the way back, she ends up talking with the PI friend who, not on her request, but he's still looking at her husband. He ends up finding information that shows that he went to a hotel. So thinking that he's cheating with that Jenna girl, this is her final straw, and she says, fuck it, I'ma cheat on his ass too with the weirdo up there. So she goes back up to the loft and they start playing Banks. So that's when you know it's going to get real stupid. I love Banks, but man, do they use her in some of the dumbest sexual contexts. Um, so she goes up and the girl that was riding him just on cue, she's like, okay, I guess it's my time to go. I've done my job. Was she hired? I don't, I don't know. But he goes up to Mia, kisses her, still got the other girl's coochie on his breath. And, and they break away in a moment of her getting her sanity back only for her to drive with him on his motorcycle back to his private studio, art studio. He's also not wearing a helmet again. So much for not being seen by paparazzi. Anyway, they ride to his private studio. They light candles. They start uh, playing Unravel Me. So somebody about to get to And they do that on top of his canvas covered in paint. How do I put this? And this is something I said on Twitter. This is one of the gayest straight sex scenes I've ever seen in my life. And I've watched see him (laughs) <laughs> I'm no rookie to man-centric straight sex made for the gay male gays and me. <laughs> this a gay ass sexy. You can't see her at all. This n- is oiled up, got paint going into his ass crack. His booty is the full focus of it. He, he doing the little hip swirl. Unravel me. I'm like, hmm. When she wakes up, he has a painting of her on the ceiling. That don't scare y'all. That don't give you serial killer. But he's like, I've always seen myself with a woman like you. Like, we should just run away, go to the Dominican Republic. She's like, oh, this sounds nice. I love this fantasy. But much in the way that fantasies end, she comes back to her office the next day and there is Cal and Charlize there saying, where the f*** have you been? Because we had to move his mom to a hotel that's closer to the hospital. Where were you? So obviously he wasn't cheating on her. He was just trying to help his mama get closer to the hospital. (laughs) My bad. (laughs) Cal is like, I'm just trying to save our relationships. Please tell me what's going on. And she's like, I'm sorry. And we never reach a conclusion. So he just leaves. Now riddled with guilt, Mia goes back to the loft, gives Zaire his case files. And she says she wants to give the case to somebody else. And Zaire is like, nah, I know you feel guilty. I know you feel a lot of emotions, but I don't want you to leave. She's like, I'm more concerned about my marriage and my husband. This, I, no. He's like, I need you. You can't leave me. You gonna leave me like that? I'm up for like execution. I'm like, you knew that before you were trying to fuck her. You spearheaded this. You were the aggressor here. You were the one that was stepping over boundaries. You up for death penalty. And now she's like, oh, well, I I gotta leave now. This is bad. Again, that's what I call sickness. You need help. Mia then admits to cheating to the PI friend. And he's like, "It's a, I understand you're only human. You thought he was cheating, which I love how no one gets mad at the PI, even though it is kind of his fault because he didn't have full information and was like, hey, yo, nigga got a hotel. It's like, I mean, I get it, whatever. After this, Mia does decide to go talk to the gallery owner. And considering she was considering giving the case away, I don't know why she's doing this, but okay. Fine. Talks with the gallery owner who I've seen in other Tyler Perry works. Mia comes in and uh, the woman is very quickly like, you fuck him yet? <laughs> Cause everybody has. And then she commences to tell the story of her and Zaire, which we've already heard part of it because he told them. But she's like, I helped him make headway in his career. And as soon as he did, he left me, threw me away. Mia asks about violence. Does he have a history of violence? Um, she says, no, he was never violent towards her, but he's like a snake and snakes only attack when they're in the correct pouncing distance but luckily for her he left before that instead all he did was charm her he sat her down in front of an easel asked about her recent breakup how did it make you feel what color did it make you feel she says blue he has her paint waves he says you seem pretty angry that sounds like red to me and so she paints red lines before you know it she wakes up with a painting of her face on the ceiling obviously Mia leaves distraught because all he did was spit game. If you want to think of it as the mildest way, if you want to think it as like psychopathy, fair. So she goes to his loft. He's painting, not really paying attention. And she goes up to the bed and starts peeling off the paintings on the ceiling to find different women's portraits 
up there. She peels them away one by one and then he notices that she's doing it and he's like, no, no, no. And then it gets to the picture of the girl that died, Heidi, and it says, die you bitch, you ruined my life. <laughs> Very subtle. And so she screams, I quit, get you a new lawyer, I am done. He claims, no, I didn't murder her, you can't go. And she's like, what are you gonna do? You're gonna tell my husband? You're gonna tell the bar? I'll tell him myself. He's like, no, I love you. <laughs> Luckily, she's like, you full of shit and leaves. I will say this, you know, wasn't terrible acting outside of the body posture she had when she said, Start your fucking elevator! like the Super Saiyan <laughs> posture, but better nonetheless. So she goes back to her sister-in-law's house, Charlize's house, and that is where things really fall apart. And they weren't very well sewn together in the first place, so bear with me. <clears throat> Instead of going the ping-ponging of dialogue, I'm just gonna tell you what comes out in this conversation because otherwise we'll just all be confused together. So Cal admits to everyone that he lost his job and that Mia has been supporting him the entire time and that he was lying to them about supporting her. Mom, still blames Mia for some reason because she's an evil bitch. Ray tells everyone that Mia is off the case for Zaire Malloy because quote, she had an inappropriate relationship with a client. I don't know how he knows that. Um, I don't think she would have to admit anything to to the bar or something for why she's leaving the case. I don't know, maybe she does, um, but it's a movie. Cal is able to deduce that she had fucked Zaire Malloy. He gets very upset about it. He literally starts flipping tables. Mother-in-law throws her out of the house and Charlize runs after her trying to calm her down and support her, but she ends up having to go all the same. In an effort to clear her head, Mia goes on a trip to the Dominican Republic alone. And this is where she hears more about Zaire taking a plea deal in which he would be able to get parole. And while she's here, she ends up taking a jog on the beach where she ends up running into Heidi, the girl that supposedly Zaire killed. So she goes after, her. she's like, I don't speak English. I'm like, yes, you do, bitch. You're the one that was to <laughs> And then in an effort to get away, she sprays her in the face with bathroom cleaner. And then Mia calls Ray. She's like, he's innocent. The girl that he supposedly killed, I just saw her in the Dominican Republic. He's like, no, I can't let him go because this is my big break, blah, 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 blah. And Mia's like, you have an innocent man in jail. Again, I don't know how innocent he is. But okay, giving weirdo to me. And then Ray is like, you know what, you're right. Come back home, I'll send my own private investigators out there to question her. So she comes back home. This is where things get really, 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 really dumb. It was already dumb. It's getting really, 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 really dumb. She comes home, bear with me. She goes over the brother and sister-in-law's house and she ends up finding a painting of Charlize that was made by Zaire. And from this, she reaches the conclusion that Charlize had also had an affair with Zaire. If you recall, he mentioned, uh, Ray mentioned in the earliest part of the movie that she, he had some paintings from Zaire. So this is one of those paintings. I don't know why we assume that he slept with her considering like, does this not paint for money ever? Does he only paint for pussy? He don't take commissions? Okay, she leaves the room stunned and the uh, mother-in-law bumps into her accidentally breaking her phone. Ray makes her a drink. Everything's really ominous. I wouldn't drink that if I were you. She doesn't. And Mia is like, check your phone, Ray, because my private investigator says that your mom doesn't have cancer. Just, just follow me. <laughs> Does it make sense? No, just accept that things are happening. However, he already knew she didn't have cancer. That it was this long con of them faking a story of his mother having cancer so that he could get sympathy votes when he runs for mayor. <laughs> but apparently Cal doesn't know that that is a lie. The mom then cartoonishly cheers to Charlize because she had sex with a penniless artist and apparently Charlize didn't know that the mom knew that she had cheated on Ray with Zaire. Ray comes out with the painting and mom is like, I can't believe you two were so stupid to sleep with the same guy. Oh, my head hurts. Um, <laughs> my head is spinning. So Mia goes to Charlize and she's like, let's just go, let's just run. And the mother-in-law goes to Charlize and is like, stab her as if she was also in on the plan. And But Charlize is like, I can't, she's my friend. And so instead she goes, Goes trying to stab Ray. He catches it and knocks her out. Then the mama tries to stab Mia, but she's able to get away. Now this is a stupid side note, but I did notice that 
Kelly, uh, her her mic pack was visible during the fight. That was just funny to me. But anyway, there's a tussle. She ends up beating Ray in the head with a cast iron skillet. Good to see that the cast iron skillet is still canon in Tyler Perry movies. Then from the floor, he randomly materializes a gun and shoots at Mia, but misses. In an effort to have a redemptive arc, here comes Charlize and she hits Ray with the pan again. But when she turns around, the mama stabs her. She did. Mia's able to get in one of the cars and drives off. The mom is on the front of the windshield. And then while she's driving, she ends up crashing into a car, catapulting the mama off, <laughs> off the windshield killing her instantly. Great. After the crash, the car won't start. So she starts running down the street aimlessly until she ends up serendipitously running into Cal. She's like, oh my God, they trying to kill me. Call the police, call the police. Your brother tried to kill me. She gets in the car and then she notices that he's driving back to the house. I just told you that they tried to kill me. And he's like, we got to wait for the police at the home. But while he's on the phone with the police, she turns up the radio, noticing that he hadn't disconnected Bluetooth from his phone. And she hears that he's actually on the phone with Ray, who's saying she figured it out. She's coming back you gotta get, bring her back home <sighs> me oh stressing me out i'm about to turn my uh chair massager on because oh. so he does a whole reveal about how ray said that she would leave him at any point that mia would leave cal at any point um that he was never good enough for her and he recommended ray recommended that cal beat her <laughs> That's not funny. I'm just like, what the? Because she thinks she's too good for you and you need to get her into line. And he's like, nah, I wanted to handle things the sweet way. She's like, why? Why did you do all this? Because you're weak? Because I was with a man who's a real man, referring to Zaire, who has money and success. And so he slaps her in the face. All right. Right then, a semi truck comes towards them on the opposite side of the road. And either she's just really good at physics or is a true believer in God uh, because she undoes his seatbelt and swerves the car into said semi truck, hitting him specifically with enough time for her to, I guess, roll out of the, the car. I don't know. It's, uh, but he goes out of the windshield, dies, okay. And then uh, the police end up at the house. They arrest Ray, he's the only one still alive. And within the like three minutes of being on the scene, they know the whole backstory about how he did this whole like long con scheme. Um, and Zaire now is innocent, free to wear all the sunglasses he wants. And he ends up saying to close up camera that's following him that he appreciates Mia. And uh, she's looking at him from the corner in her spy gear. And she walks off as the movie fades to black. That was so f stupid <laughs> yeah, that's the movie there are so many stupid parts of this movie that i'm not even gonna waste my time asking all the questions and clearing up all the plot holes or whatever but there were just some that i noted mainly if heidi's alive whose blood and skull fragments was that who came up with the life insurance policy what is the connection between ray the mom and the girl who isn't dead did they pay her how did they get her to like they don't say anything about that connection how did they frame him did they frame him whose blood and skull is that why are we supposed to be sympathetic to zaire he's still f creepy he still doesn't respect women's boundaries so like he he would still give possible serial killer or rapist like i don't know how did he get the name of being like the guy who dates women have sex with them and kills them if there was only one woman does he have that moniker and i whatever there's so many other questions but i just don't care enough to ask i just all i want to say is that tyler perry you've done enough you've done plenty please put the pen down it's all right we don't we don't need to do this anymore <laughs> like like the convolution has reached a level that it makes my head hurt and i want to be free please you've made so much money let this go thank you that's my call to action everyone um but yeah that's today's video i want to know have you seen the movie what were your thoughts on it it's absolutely terrible isn't it feel free to like this video subscribe and all that oh we are at 700k baby hey shout outs um long time coming but i gotta say 
each time we make a new milestone, I'm so proud because it's just me sitting here talking. <laughs> it's no cool, no, no cool stuff going on. Just me uh, talking. And it's like, wow, I have 700,000 besties who just want to sit and hear me talk about shit and, and, and kiki in the comments. So for that, I very much so appreciate it. Onward to a million? That'd be nice. <laughs> yeah, so if you like this video, feel free to like it. Follow me on all my social media, Instagram and Twitter, both of which are Kenny JD. Um, I say really funny things on Twitter, so I think you should follow me there particularly. Also, you should listen to my podcast, Connect the Dots, where I'm the co-host, along with Sean Peckus, where we interview real celebrities, people that are much more famous than me, and I sit there and awkwardly ask questions. So if you wanted to see me be awkward in another context, that's where you can do it, baby. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye.